doesn't. And she also, the, one of the things about their belief system that's, that's weird is that she says um, that she wasn't taught to, oh, where was this? She wasn't taught to see race, um, but she was because, and now at some point she was, and now she is teaching other people to see race and, and to judge people. When I say see race, I don't just mean see, of course we all see race. I mean, to judge people and treat them differently on the basis of race. They, they have like this defeatist um, sort of attitude towards the world where they say, um, we believe that it is impossible um, to overcome um, uh, racism. We believe it's impossible to, to, to try and not judge people and treat them differently on the basis of race. Therefore, we're going to go ahead and say we have to all do that, too. We have to all start doing this. And we have to teach children in kindergarten to start doing this, to start looking through a lens of race and judging everyone on that basis and treating them differently on that basis. We have to do that because unfortunately that's the way the world is. That's it, it's this real defeatist attitude and, it, and it's directly opposed to um, the concept of individualism, which is what led us to, to progress to the point we got to before this cancer started taking over this ideological cancer. I mean, Martin Luther King Jr. wasn't saying go out and um, treat people differently on the basis of race. He said the opposite. That's how, that's how you, the antidote to collectivism is individualism. It is saying that we're all created equal. We're not equal in any sense um, in terms of our lives, but we're created. You should treat people equally. You shouldn't treat them differently because of things like sex or race or sexuality um, but we're never going to be, they seem to live in this, this, I don't know, this, this, uh, um, delusion that we can get to a point where we're all, um, robots who have exactly the same life experience and exactly the same job and exactly the same <laughs> level of, I mean, if they're going to be calculated on their, you know, their prejudice calculator, or I mean, their privilege calculator that we're all equally privilege. And that's just impossible. That's not the way life works. I'm privileged in some ways and I'm marginalized to borrow their words, marginalized in others. Everyone is. Everyone mm -hmm. is. Yeah. And I mean, I think that you make a really good point there because, um, you know, one of the things that I think about when I think about people being equal is not being equal in terms of circumstance or even or being equal in terms of experience, but we all start in terms of being of equal value. I am not fundamentally more valuable as a human being than you or anyone else. We all start of equal value, which is total. I mean, everyone, every single person in this world has value. And just to take it to from, from a spiritual perspective, because, you know, I'm spiritual. I know you, you are, you're spiritual as well um, in different ways, of course. You know, when I think that when God looks at us, you know, we come from God, like God loves us unconditionally. We have unconditional value. We don't have to do anything to earn being valuable in this world. We are valuable for the sake of being here. But what she's talking about is fundamentally different than that. It's everyone has to have the same opportunities. Everyone has to have the same outcomes. And that's that not realistic. outcomes is not realistic. Well, yeah. It's not right. realistic at all. I didn't mean to cut yeah. you up. You hit the nail on the head. It's, it's like, um, they talk about equality and equity sometimes it, the interchangeably, which is incorrect. Um, equality, when I use it, and I, it's always helpful to define terms because you can figure out if this person's talking about something different than you are. But equality of access, abs absolutely. We, sh we have removed and we should remove any barriers to access under um, the law. Under the law, right. Yeah. Under which is law. an important distinction because I will never be a player in the NBA. Right. There's no the way to remove out. that. There's no way to, <laughs> yeah. And so, but, but they want a quality of outcome. They mm -hmm. want us all to be doing the same thing at the same. It's like, um, sometimes I've, I've heard somebody say about Marxism and this is a, a mutated kind of Marxism that they want us to all be equal in the rubble. <laughs> they won't be happy until we're all equal mm -hmm. in, you know, everything that they've destroyed. Um, but why would you want to live in a world like that? There's a short story that Carter and I recommend a lot. Um, it, it's really short. You can find it online for free and read it in a, a sitting. It's so short. It's uh, called Harrison Bergeron. It's by Kurt Vonnegut. 
And it's a dystopian future in which the government has decided to make everyone equal in outcome. And so they go, they give people handicaps depending on whatever it is, whatever their privileges or talents are. And so if you are a ballerina and you're really good ballerina, they put weights on your legs so that you can't dance better than the other dancers. All the entertainment they watch is just is mediocre and awful because they don't want anyone to be funnier or more talented than anyone else. Um, If you're intelligent, they put um, they put something in your head that that rings loudly. So your thoughts are constantly disrupted to try and bring your IQ down to the same level as like average. They want everyone to be average. It's, it's a really great short story. I actually, um, I just watched, uh, Carter told me there was a, a movie version that had come out years ago and I'd never seen it. Yeah. I just watched it. It's, it's, it's kind of low budget, but it's good. It, the, the story is so short that you can't make a movie out of it. So they really just took the kernel of the idea and then they wrote the whole movie. It's, it's, diff- it's a different entity than the short story, but it's the same basic idea where they're handicapping everyone to make them to have this equality of outcome. And then what happens in the movie you see is that there's an elite, you find out that there's an elite group of people who separate themselves, who are basically in charge of everything that most people don't know they exist. And, and they justify this by saying, it's just like an animal farm in Orwell. Some animals are more equal than others. They're basically Aww. like, we have to do this. We have to do this so that, so that everyone's happy and that everything's equal. And um, we are uniquely suited to, you know, we're taking one for the team. We've, you know, just like an animal farm where the, the pigs pretended like it was such a burden to be in charge of the other animals. Like, oh, someone's got to go sleep in the big house and wear the farmer's mm-hmm. clothes and drink all the alcohol. It's got to be us. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. Well, I think it's so funny you bring up Animal Farm, too, because Robin D'Angelo has a very distinct Animal Farm moment in White oh, Fragility. Yeah? What is she it? really does. <laughs> uh, and we'll, well, we'll get to that in a bit. I okay. want to take a super chat first, though, because I wanted to stay on this topic of... Um, I think this topic of like experience and and a quality of opportunity versus outcome is interesting. And I think another thing I wanted to say on that is like from from even a spiritual perspective or probably from a human perspective too, a quality of outcome is not ideal, not just in terms of it not being realistic, but in terms of I believe that what defines us as a person are the the struggles that we have, the obstacles that we overcome. And so if the goal is trying to build a world where everyone has their safe space and no one ever feels offended and everyone has everything handed to them, then there's nothing to overcome. There's nothing to work towards. There's no character to be built. And it's so sad to me watching these kids I, I, I think an entire generation is going to be lost in terms of their individual resiliency to overcoming, yeah. overcoming, um, what is the word, like barriers or obstacles. And that's sad. There's just no character to be built there. You're right. And what they're trying to do, I, I've seen that the, um, some people make the mistake, um, some conservatives or, or maybe not even conservatives, but just people who disagree with this ideology, I think make the mistake of thinking, well, those kids who are being indoctrinated with this and with no resiliency, like you're talking about, um, and, and no idea of what it means to fail and to learn from failure to get to a place where you succeed, right? That that they're going to fail when they get out into the real world, but but that's a mistake. They are changing the real world. And we've seen that happen now. It's not just in colleges. For a long time, when I, I, I first started talking about this, um, in 2017. So a couple, a few years now. And a lot of my friends who are on the left were saying, okay, well, I agree with you that this is kind of an, it's an extreme ideology and, but it's just at the colleges, like you're, you're making a mountain out of a molehill and these kids are going to get in the real world and learn the, the failings of this belief system. But that's not, that's, I've never believed that to be true. And I think the past two months show that that's not true because they are now, they're remaking the world. They are going out and becoming, look, the people who were doctoring when I was, I, w- I went into entertainment. Um, the, my friends went into uh, academia. They went into journalism. They, they went into um, big social. They work for the, the companies like YouTube and Google and, and places that are now censoring based on this ideology. And you, we see now in the past two months, now that it's gone mainstream, it's become culturally dominant all the major corporations are speaking it. It's a really cheap version of it that they're speaking, but they're speaking it and they're indoctrinated their, their employees. They're making them go to seminars like, 
white fragility seminars and they're making them read book indoctrinating books like this one. And so much so I'll just give one quick anecdote. There's a, a former friend, I, an acquaintance I knew when I worked in entertainment who had uh, a lot of people unfriended me over the past few years, but he had not, I guess. And I hadn't heard from him in years, but he came out of the woodwork recently to comment on my page and to call me uh, a white nationalist and other awful untrue things. Um, but he, he works at, he's a senior vice president at full screen, which is a Warner media group company. And he had, um, I, I went and looked to see what he had been talking about online recently. Cause I hadn't for, heard from him forever. And he was tweeting all this stuff about, he was so proud to be at Warner where they're, they're doing these um, anti-racism dismantling racism trainings. And it's all this kind of white fragility stuff. He had just been through that indoctrination seminar. And what did he learn from it? He came to my page to say things that weren't true. And then here was the really interesting part. When you take these ideas, she uses a lot of words to not really say anything. Mm -hmm. This is this book is, I mean, more than anything, it's just boring because she's saying the same thing over and over. Um, when you take these ideas, which are somewhat obscured by the pseudo intellectual uh, language and stuff that she uses where people feel like, oh, I guess I just don't quite get it. Or she's, she's causing you to do mental gymnastics so that you can try and deny to yourself that um, that there that there's something wrong that there's not something wrong with treating people differently on the basis of race. But see, when you filter when that gets filtered down from academia to a, a workshop like this, where people are learning this, um, to and I'm going to I'm going to name Colin in the third person. I'm not talking to him. I'm going to he's kind of a moron. When it comes out of his mouth, you hear what it really is. And so what he said to me on my wall, I said, look, the reason why I reject social justice ideology, it was my religion for 20 years. But once I realized what it really is, I reject it because it is racist, because it is sexist, and because I oppose those things. And so I don't care what you call me or um, the repercussions of coming out against it. I think it's wrong and I think it's dangerous. And I think it is, it, it teaches people to judge people and treat them differently on the basis of race and sex. And do you know what he said to me, Carlin? What? He said, of course, we must treat people differently on the basis of race. We must judge them and treat them differently on the basis of race. And I was like, thank you. That's, that's beautiful. Thank you for telling me that because you've distilled the essence of this ideology out of the mouth of a moron comes what it really is when it gets filtered all the way down and, and, uh, or, or the mouth of a child and not that a child's a moron. I'm just saying it with a childlike way of thinking. There are kids who are being indoctrinated with this stuff in school and are, I've heard people say, you know, my kid came home or their classmate came, said to my kid that, um, they learned in school today that white people are bad. That's the essence of it. That's what comes out when you when you strip it of this pseudo intellectual veneer that it holds with mm -hmm. all of these many, many magic words.